Hi, I'm Mike Nottleman, and this is a special live webcast of The Coin Show, live from the World's Fair of Money in Rosemont, Illinois. Now, normally, my partner, Matt Digger, would be here with me, but he and his wife just weeks ago welcomed her third son, James, into the world, so he is at home tending the family business, but I am here to bring you another really exciting show. We hope that you hang around today and enjoy the show that we put together for you, because for the second year in a row, we are live from the board's floor of the World's Fair of Money in Rosemont, Illinois, and this is The Coin Show. Well, kind of. Our guests today will include Beth Deicher, author and former editor of Coin World magazine, Steve Roach, current editor of Coin World, Indian Head and Flying Eagle Scent expert Rick Snow, my favorite Eisenhower dollar expert James Siegel of SMS Coins, and Dennis Tucker, the publisher of the publishing in Atlanta. We also uh, may have some other great surprises for you if time allows. So I hope you stay with us and enjoy. Now, if you're watching the live webcast or if you're listening at some later time on either money.org or coinshowradio.com, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. We're here at the World Mint Stage at the 2014 ANA World's Fair of Money in Rosemont, Illinois. As I've said, we have some great guests lined up, so without any further delay, Let's get down to it. Would you please welcome Beth Teicher. Beth, thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time uh, out for us and for our show. Beth is the former editor of Coin World Magazine. She served as editor from 1985 to 2012, and it, uh, which is a longer tenure in that capacity than anyone else in the magazine's history. She was the lead witness in July 1995 for a congressional hearing that discussed circulating commemorative coins. These hearings eventually resulted in the 50 State Quarters Program, one of the most popular commemorative programs in U.S. history. Beth has contributed to or written a number of my personal favorite reference books, including Coin World's Making the Grade and the Coin World Almanac, but her most recent work is a book that I have raved about to almost anyone that will listen. It is entitled Cash in Your Coins, Selling the Rare Coins You've Inherited. Beth, welcome. Thank you. What was the impetus for you to write Cash in Your Coins? Well, uh, during the years that I worked at Coin World, often at lunchtime, I would cover the phones. And we would get people who would call in, and typically it would be a family member or a wife, a widow. And they would like to know, uh, what do I do with my coins? I don't know what they're worth, can you tell me? And of course, early on, you're standing there with a phone in your ear, and they want you to appraise thousands of coins in a second. And normally, we would, I would say to them, well, do uh, you have any idea of what you have? Do you have an inventory? Typically, they did not. So we would start them out and suggest that they get a red book or get a copy of Coin World and go through our uh, value section that in the early days was called Trends. And once they began to identify them, typically they would call back. But we really didn't have a way to help people. And these were people who were not the, the hobbyists. Typically, the husband or the father or the son would have collected the coins. And our hobby is about 90% male. Yes. So, and for whatever reason, the coin collecting activity was not shared with the family. So, they were pretty much at a loss. And I decided uh, when I retired from the world, there was one book. I was going to write. It was going to be for the thousands of people who had called us over the years, and for what I've come to learn from many, many people out there in that situation. It is, it is not a unique situation. It's something that, that many people come upon, and it's, it's never, it's usually not good circumstances, so they're, they're also grieving, and you know, they have a lot going on, and then they have this, this, uh, Responsibility of, of trying to care for something and trying to to settle something that they really don't have a lot of expertise in. Um, in my opinion, the book is unique 
from any that I have ever seen before, in that it addresses the reader as a thing, versus, you know, being a coin collector, which is would be the ideal situation. So therefore everything is written as if the reader really knows nothing about coins. This makes it a really good book for beginners and coin collectors as well as heirs, and that's probably why personally it you know, touches that in me. Where did you come up with this angle of taking it from language perspective? Well, uh, in talking with uh, those who have written about it, and also just talking with people in general, uh, once you've been in the hobby, you realize we have our own nomenclature, and it's like a foreign language. So, in order to help people understand, I knew that I had to get it to a very basic level for, for them to understand, because if you begin with a lot of terms that they don't understand, you're not doing the service to them. You're going to lose it. It's true. Sure. You break down coins. Like metal, and I think this is really smart because you know coins are primarily metal. Different metals and finishes should be handled differently. Most importantly, copper. And this is something that I've learned the hard way many times. One of the things that you advise is something that I've never seen suggested as any of this kind of work at all, and that is to wear a dust mask. Why is a dust mask a necessary uh, tool? Well, uh, especially if you're talking or if you happen to have food anywhere near and you're eating, uh, the spittle and the, the particles from what you're eating could fall on the floor. And particularly copper is susceptible. And they may not realize it, or the person who's handling the coins may not realize that these tiny particles have gotten on the copper, but if they are put away, then you kind of get a corrosion spotting the coins. And uh, it's a good procedure for anyone who's going to be handling uh, expensive coins. It's a good routine whether you are a, a seasonal collector or not. Sure, I've, I've seen some beautiful proof coins, particularly proof sets. That, you know, the finish on them is so high end, and you see the black carpet spots. And so often they come from you know, having breathed over the top of the coin, something that, that I guess you really wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't understand, or you wouldn't just think of copying it. Yeah. Good organization is also the key to sorting through a collection of any things, especially when trying to discover what the collection contains. You've created an easy to use system for going through masses of coins and notes that you would. Uh, either be familiar or unfamiliar with. Is this just human nature being meticulous like that? It's part of my nature, but I think it's trying to think how uh, a novice would approach just a pile of coins. And I suggest they first separate them by color. They may not know that a coin is silver or copper or whatever, but I gave them a guide to separate by color and also by size. We also have a picture guide by design and denomination, and we purposely have a large picture so that they can see the detail. But we also have one that is, that is actual size so that they can be sure of what denomination it is. Now, some of our earlier points don't have denomination on them. Uh, so you, you, as you have to put yourself in the role of a person who knows nothing and walk them through this process. So I try to, in every instance, really go to the basics and methodically walk the person through how to identify the coins. Yeah, this, this book uh, suggests first sorting the coins by type, which in practice also sorts them by metallic content before examining them for rarity. Now, when somebody uses this method, it's much more difficult to miss things that may not necessarily be thought of by the average layman. Um, what percentage of coins today do you estimate are sold purely for the metal content without consideration? That's really difficult to say. Um, we've been through a series of belts uh, you know, within my lifetime. Probably the greatest was in the, in the 1960s. 
And it's because nobody kept records. We don't really know. What the, the bottom line is, many of our coins are rare today because there were wholesale mills, and particularly silver coins, and of course some gold coins. Um, it, it's, and even today, you're having people sell silver coins for the melt value without having an understanding that they could be rare and worth a lot more than milk value. So that's one of the things that uh, we did early on in the book was to explain the difference between the bullion value of each of the, the coin metal types and also walk them through what to look for and a quick guide for key dates, things that would be worth more than no value. But it's anybody who tells you they have a, a firm number, they're they're really kind of kidding you because nobody has that number. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that uh, a lot of the Morgan dollars were melted in this printing. Just there are no numbers for what was melted, so the vintage figures are really they're not even a guy at this point because there's no touch to what ended up leaving what did. I've seen coin dealers taking collections of modern coins, 20th century stuff, and 90% silver coins, and just simply count them, throw them into a coin counter without any real examination before they make an offer. <coughs> now, if one uses metal as the primary evaluating tool, how much danger do they put themselves in as far as undervaluing coins when they want to sell them? It can be huge because um, depending on the, the date and the mint mark, you can be talking thousands of dollars, uh, certainly hundreds sometimes. And it, it was a fun talking with non-collectors, knowing that those tiny little letters made such a difference. I, I remember explaining to a lady about a Carson City dollar and showing her where the little CC was on the back and she was just incredulous. You mean that's the difference between eighteen dollars and eighteen hundred dollars and it truly was. So it's tiny two little C's. The, those two little C's. Um, so if those who don't take the time are usually the losers. Now your book then goes through almost every series, by series, and describes what to look for in terms of value. Now, I think this is important for evaluation, since it's not only key or rare date points, but I have value. Did you enlist any help in determining what to look for in each series? Um, I guess I don't understand your question. <laughs> or did you ask experts to help you as far as what to evaluate, or did you go basically by your knowledge and your experience? Uh, certainly, uh, through knowledge and experience, again, over the years, and you have to understand, in 31 years in the coin world, uh, I certainly talked to lots of collectors, lots of dealers, uh, having attended many, many auction viewing sessions, written about coins. So the basics were, you know, Those pretty, were pretty, well within pretty your evident, command. yes. Now, single coins aren't the only thing covered in this you also touch on the proof sets. Most of these are underappreciated because they're relatively common. Do you give any advice to heirs that find themselves with a vast array of sets? Uh, certainly, uh, we have a list of sets that have particularly rare points within them, like some of the uh, uh, sets and no bit more dimes and things of that nature, giving them the year. Uh, of the set to look for and say, you know, you should examine these sets before you just sell them in bulk because it's what we're looking for. And often, uh, also, what we point out to them uh, that dealers, especially, and, and sometimes collectors do this, is they open the sets and sell the coins singly. And often, the coins, if you sell them singles, as opposed to a set, or work more than the set. So we try to make them aware of the opportunities for selling. And then they can take that advice as they would for Sure. Now, although the title suggests that this book is about coins exclusively, 
many collectors of this dabble in other pursuits. And to your credit, you touch on many of them. Uh, you discuss paper money, tokens and medals, medallions, copies of coins and even foreign coins. How do you treat so many subjects without trying to be all things to all readers, or without making the book just an you know, incredibly thick? Well, what we tried to do was to give them a basic understanding of the various things in, under the broad umbrella of schematics and to give them information to, and also in the back of our book, we give them a list of other reference books. But the, the basics are the same, whether you're using uh, or whether you're looking at uh, uh, foreign coins, U.S. coins, uh, the identification and valuing, there is the same process. And the similar thing with paper money, uh, we give them the basics of how to identify them and then give them reference materials for further information and also some websites where they can get vast amounts of information today free. I think it's one of the things that impressed me the most about the book was that it handled so many things and touched on so many things without just really requiring you, you know, in, in volume. That's the uh, all the sections that we've discussed so far are what made the book fascinating for me. A green expert of sorts, that's generous. And uh, something that I really enjoyed reading. I think that this adds to the mainstream appeal of the book. But then you give advice on creating an inventory of your collection. And even from an organizational standpoint, I think that this is valuable to collectors and layman alike. If, like me, you're not the world's most, most organized person, you give a solid advice on how to organize any collection and create a useful inventory. And I pers personally want to thank you for that. Um, but then comes the part of the book where the rubber really hits the road, and that's determining the value of what you have. How do you determine what sources the name should use to evaluate what they have? Well, as I indicated, today we have so many resources that are available online that are free. Um, if there's a large collection and a person just does not have the time or need that, want to do this, uh, it's always uh, something that they can entertain is having an independent appraisal, uh, seeking either um, someone knowledgeable, uh, a collector, or a dealer. The one thing that we advise is when you get uh, an appraisal, make it perfectly clear to the appraiser that you are not going to sell the coins to that appraiser. That avoids the conflict of interest. And, and we have a whole uh, chapter on appraisals, how they're conducted, how to find a, a good appraiser, and what kinds of information you should be able to expect from an appraiser. So it is by, by using the, the appraisal and, and making it very clear to the, the person doing the appraisal there. It's not going to be a venue to purchase. That is one of the ways that you use to really help them optimize an honest opinion on what they're going to do. Well, I begin the book uh, by saying, do you know the value of what you have? If you don't, you're already at a disadvantage. And, and the premise of the book is helping a person find what, find out what they have and how to value it and arrive at a value, and then strategies for what they want to do with, with the book, I mean, with the coin uh, collection or paper money collection. So it's it's all up to the person. They have many avenues. And what we wanted to do was to make it uh, a very simple procedure. It's a complicated topic, but you have to take it in bite-sized increments so that they can walk through the process? It's, it's, well, I, I use the word in my review, I use the word God's son. And I really did mean that, because I, I really think that this, this is a book that, that helps people. I mean, I think there's not a lot of opportunity to do that this holiday. 
this is something that's really making people better off for having read. That's just a personal thing. I've also mentioned that you've written other books. Of the books that you've written, do you have a personal favorite? Well, I think uh, other than the, the um, Dr. Seuss books, my personal favorite is Making the Gray, because that helps a person understand what grading is all about. And grading is so fundamental to determining a coin's value. If you don't know what the gray or the condition is, then you really are handicapped in knowing the value. And I am not a grader. I tried to get other people to write and make them a grade, and they all said, we're too busy. And so um, I struck a deal with Mike Finney, who was grading in Panax, and I said, I want to come and pick your brain. And you tell me what this process entails. And we did that for every week for a better part of about three years. And it started as a column in Coin Values magazine. So all we had to do was to keep the case. As we progressed, people would come in at different intervals and they would say, When are you going to write about Morgan Dollars? Well, that was the first series that we wrote about but because it's the most popular collected, or it was at that time. And so after we got through the first 25 series, we realized we should compile these into a book. And then we got up to 50. So we did a second edition. And by that time, everybody is clamoring for to a ball. So we did that. Uh, also, I collaborated with Jim Halpern for the coin maps. Uh, many years ago, in the uh, early 80s, when I first came into the hobby, in order to understand grading, I read his book. And his uh, does not go series by series, but it, it gives you the fundamentals of what you're looking at. A chance to grade or assess the condition of a coin. So, for me, it was a learning process. I entered writing that book as a true novice, and I learned a lot. I am still not an expert grader, but I feel that we put in the hands of people the information that if you pay attention to the maps, all of the photographs that are included for all the series and the grades, you can pretty well grade your points by that book. And I have to confess that when we began that project, I had no idea that uh, we would publish uh, a book of that nature. Amazing book. Is there a niche that you see in the area of our books that needs to be written that you can't personally tell? I'm not sure that it's a niche, but I, I think we need to be able to bring coin collecting and the fun of collecting uh, to a greater audience. Uh, I used to tell the people at Coin World that coin collecting was the best kept secret I'd ever seen because you learn so much. It, it touches history, economics, metallurgy. Uh, all kinds of fields. And, and what I loved about working in the world and what I love about the hobby, it is constant learning. And for people who just say, oh, you're a food collector, they don't get it. They don't understand what you learn from the coin collector and from research and, and the, also meeting people and traveling. They really don't understand what our hobby has to offer. And I don't think we have a book out there yet that reaches beyond our kind of inner circle of coin collectors. So if somebody can do that book, a copy table book that grabs the world and says, you know what, this is a pretty cool book, uh, I go to it. Uh, I would love to see that book done. Now, you've written or edited other books about coins and coin collecting, including um, my, one of my favorite all-time coin world author, 
do you have anything in the works that we can anticipate? Anything new? Well, um, as a matter of fact, you're glad I brought that fact, up. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, have done a second edition of Cashing Your Coins. It was, the first edition was published in June of 2013. Uh, we're near a sell out. And uh, our publisher, uh, Whitman, Dennis Tucker, called and said, I know that you told me that there are things that you wanted to add. We're ready for a second edition. And so this book, which will be uh, in the stores in about three weeks, uh, I, I received this copy at 5 o'clock last night, UPS. First time I had seen the book. Uh, and um, so it will be available, but what it does, it has a new chapter about taxes. We had some information about estate taxes, inheritance taxes, capital gains, uh, sales tax, all of those kinds of things. We had a look, some information on the first edition, but as I've traveled the country in the last year, we've done book signings and presentations. We had so many questions, and I realized that we had to be more in depth in that, so we um, added 16 pages, most of which deal with uh, taxes. Uh, we added uh, more information about uh, appraisals, and we updated uh, quite a bit of information. You, you don't realize how much happens in the year in this field. Uh, because we, we uh, have information about different laws that affect us, uh, we updated those and we had a few prices. And of course, uh, the metals market has changed in the last year, so uh, a lot of the examples that we have given uh, on how to calculate values, we updated to make that work. That's going to change, but the, probably the, the biggest bonus in the second edition is a really in-depth treatment on taxes and how they affect you as a collector, but more importantly, how they will affect your heirs and what you should do now so that your heirs get full value from your collection. There are things that if you don't do before the day that you pass beyond this earth will affect your heirs dramatically. So we walk you through that, just like we did in the early edition, walking people through uh, and taking them by the hand, literally, to say, watch out for this. It's, it's, it's not always an easy subject to, to deal with the beginning. It's, hard. It's, it's, it's handled very well. I'd like to let everyone know that cashing your coins, selling the rare coins you've inherited, second edition, and as soon as we release by Whitman, if you do not own a copy of this book, you definitely should. Beth, thank you so much for stopping by and taking the time your business schedule to talk to us about your projects. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Beth Dyscher. Make plans now to attend the 2015 Summer Seminar at the American Numismatic Association headquarters in Colorado Springs. Session 1. Dates for next year are June 20th through June 15th, or June 20th through 25th, and session two runs from June 27th through July 2nd. The full course catalog will be available in the January edition of the New Bismutist, which will be online on the newmoney.org. And ANA members will be able to sign up online for the first time at money.org. Whether your interests are in U.S. coins, world coins, ancient coins, Military money, exo union, tokens, medals, or anything else, there's a class for you at Summer Seminar. Again, remember to save those dates June 20th through 25th for Session 1 and 27th through July 2nd for Session 2. Summer Seminar is the best education in numismatics, period. We are joined now by Steve Roach. Steve, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Steve is the current editor in chief of Coin World Magazine. He took over for Beth Deischer at that post in 2012. Steve has been faced with challenges stemming from the new world of digital media and has seen many changes in both magazine and the publishing world in general. 
Steve is also an art appraiser, a lawyer, a self-described vaude vivant. Welcome, Steve. Thanks. Many people would think writer, editor, okay, but art appraiser and coin guy? Um, it's kind of a broad range to occupy one's interest. Before anybody passes judgment, I would submit this. Coins are pocket-sized sculptures, and there's a very important intersection of these two worlds. Is there one world that you favor over the other? I love both of them. I think that coins is something I grew up with. I grew up with a passion for art and a passion for coins. So for me, it's I love coins because of their role in history, their economic, their the artistry of them. But then I love art because I mean, number one, it's bigger. It's a lot of fun to look at art in a museum. But I mean, coins are just smaller and they're more intimate. So it's like you get a lot of the same things crossing over in both. But in one, you have the public, and then in one, you have the private. It's very interesting. It's a nice dichotomy. Yeah, it's fantastic. In continuing on the coins as art theme, I would submit that they might be the art that more people are familiar with than any other ones. Oh, yeah. More people have owned an example, an example of Victor, Victor David Brenner's work than almost any other sculptor in history. Mm -hmm. And they were, are vocally critical when attempts have been made to make change to coin designs. Do you think that coin collectors are more into art than they would have even let themselves believe? Necessarily. I think I think with coin design, you never really get the avant-garde. I mean, you have a very, there's a long approval process to get a coin design when it goes from the artist's mind to the actual coin production. And I think that a lot of coin collectors like to follow rules. I think that's why sets are so popular. People like the discipline of putting together a Whitman album and then finding one coin that fits into each slot. And I think that the more formal element of having coins as being a very official, a very sanctioned public form of art, I think that appeals to coin collectors. I think that a coin collector, if they were going to like a painting, are probably going to like more traditional realistic representations rather than a crazy Jackson Pollock. Okay, that, that makes sense, because the change in coins in particular is rather slow, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes even glacial, you know, as, as far as its progress. Oh, yeah. Yes. Coin World as a magazine has faced numerous challenges over the past several years that threaten its very survival. Now, the new world of digital publishing is flourishing, and new competitors emerge almost daily. How do you anticipate the changes in publishing, and how do you plan to approach them? I mean, I think it's a little drastic to say that we are threatened or that we're sort of struggling because Coin World is still a really vibrant publication. I think that the nature of coin collecting is changing, the nature of the coin industry is changing, and we're trying to meet those needs. We're trying to meet coin collectors in the coin industry where it's at. So if you don't want to get a weekly publication, then we have a little thing for you. If you want to get your news every day, that's where we go to the web. So it provides a lot of opportunities for us to reach people in different ways that we couldn't when we were sort of harnessed to a weekly publication and that's it. I, I think it's really interesting the way that you've taken what was a traditional weekly magazine and have really turned it into more of a media group where you have your instantaneous notes with your website and you have you know, your core media things with, with, you know, being able to download a copy and read it, and yet you still have a monthly theme magazine that you put out for do that. Um, I've long contended that the physically published work has more weight. That is, by nature, a more permanent thing and therefore needs to be vetted better and researched better because most of poker magazine is pretty cheap, just can't go and change it. Do you think the general reading public agrees with this pursuit authority and and will it always lend more weight to articles that are physically printed versus virtually published? I think that differentiation between assuming that the web is a lower quality than print, I think that's slowly vanishing. I mean, I look at, I build upon everything that Ben Fleischer did in terms of quality, so I try to present the same quality online that we do in print. Just the online allows us to be a little bit more immediate and a little bit more reactive to our viewers needs. There are many advantages to internet publishing, namely in cost to distribute and in being able to update content when errors 
does Clean World use this trait to their advantage currently, and do we plan to find better ways to exploit it in the future? We try not to make errors in the first place. <laughs> so, I mean, any time that we find an error, it's like a little dagger in my heart. Like a small dagger. Some daggers are bigger than others. I mean, sometimes it's like a little hair pin, but I hate mistakes. So, we like the internet because it does allow us to provide quicker corrections of the occasional mistake, but it just lets us be able to embellish it. It lets us be able to present stories in a timeline. Like, I think about our coverage yesterday of the World Committee half done. I mean, thanks to Paul Jills, the Orlando American team that was here, we were able to provide hourly updates, and we were able to provide on-the-spot commentary for people waiting in line. And if we had a print publication, and that was all that we had, we would be able to provide that immediately. So if you are in, I mean, I use this as an example. I took a picture of the line from our hotel room, or from the hotel room that I was staying in. The line outside the convention center posted that at 610. Our peers were able to get that immediately, and I didn't even have to change out my pajamas. And that's the kind of immediacy we're trying to get online, and I mean, it's a balancing act, but I think it serves the readers well. Well, first, let me say that I've always been a big fan of Coin World. I've read it since the mid-70s, and I've been a subscriber since the mid-90s. I've seen many changes in format, even seen it go from the newspaper source to a tabloid type magazine printed on paper, to a full-fledged colored glossy magazine. In recent years, Coin World has begun publishing a monthly edition that is different from it in its format than the regular edition. I would compare it more to the monthly coin magazines that you directly to people. Was this a conscious choice uh, to compete with those magazines and attempt to do something more thematic and cohesive in terms of each as issue? or just a natural evolution that might appeal to an audience not captivated by it. I can't speak to the decision-making process that went into creating the monthly because that was done before I really came on board. Um, I think that it's a natural extension of providing people a viable newsstand product. As newsstands shrink, the weekly isn't going to compete on newsstands with other magazines that are glossy. And for us to be able to reach the widest possible audience, we have to figure out ways to take people again, meet people where they're at. They're at a newsstand. We want to create a product that lets people be able to think about collecting as a little bit of sex and hobby, understand that this is the one place that they can go every month where they can get their values, they can get their news, they can learn about coins, they can learn about paper money, ancient coins. So the monthly magazine lets us do that. You know, something I do is, is a news thing on a regular podcast. And I will tell you that I do a lot of research on different websites and seeing what is being published out there. And I will give you credit that the majority of the stuff that I see in CoinWorld is, is some very good and unique reporting and usually a bit ahead of most of the other publications. It's, it's fascinating. We try. I mean, we take a value-added approach in that we try to research every press release that comes in. We confirm things. We try to put a spin on it. Um, probably give you my personal spin on a lot of things within the pages and within their own online properties. Because especially as everyone gets the same press releases, my goal is to figure out how do we make it just a little bit different, how do we put a twist on it, and how do we add our authority to be able to hopefully help collect our own. What do you see in the future for the market? What can we expect for us in the next year? Hopefully we'll see us continue having a incredible monthly publication a robust weekly publication, you'll have an increased online presence, you'll have more blogs, you'll have a lot more, I mean, I'm learning about how to use Facebook and how to use our website as a way to better connect with our audience, and having things that we publish be participatory, rather than just us being the authoritative voice, giving it to collectors, having collectors give it back so it becomes more of a dialogue, and I'm hopeful that that will inform our coverage more going forward, and create something that's a little bit more Accessible, engaging, and helps helps people identify some more things that they can grab onto so that they can come into our hobby and stay there. I see most writers on technical subjects such as going to be educators. Do you teach or do you have any plans to become a teacher when you publish a paper? I teach at summer seminar, but I don't see myself ever being a teacher. Um, I, I couldn't imagine dealing with the bureaucracy. Do you have any projects in the works that you might want to share about? No, we just continue to publish Coin World. We continue to try to make it the most engaging publication we can. 
I hope that our readers and anyone who's listening here always feel free to email me at scrojuponyworld.com. Let me know what you think. Let me know if there's any topics that you'd like to see covered. Um, and just keep enjoying our publication, or if this is the first time you've been introduced to it, check it out, scrojuponyworld.com. And I will tell you, as, as a matter of experience, Dan actually responds to a Zoom. Yes, yes. I even respond to Twitter. You can tweet me. You can tweet me, or you're on Facebook. I'm on the Facebook. You're on Facebook. Stephen, it has been a distinct privilege to have you on. Thank you for taking the time. Okay, thank you very much for stopping by and talking to us. It's fun. The American Numismatic Association is proud to unveil its newly designed website at money.org. The new website features a brand new design, several new features for members and non-members, and it works well on a tablet or a smartphone. Be sure to check out the events page to see when a coin show might be happening in your area, or make plans to attend a great a and event like the World Center Money or the National Money Show. The dealer directory, dealer directory, We'll help you find an a and member who specializes in your field of interest or is near your home. And if you want to get involved in a local or national coin club, check out the club directory to find out what's available and when the club meets. Check out the new website now at money.org. A lifelong collector, James Siegel, owner of JMS Coins, has been buying and selling coins professionally since 1986. James has been nationally recognized for his knowledge on the rise of dollars. He collaborated with John Wexler and Kevin Flynn in the authoritative reference guide to rise of silver dollars. James has handled many of the top rated modern coins in the registry sets. Additionally, he has helped with many top registry sets. He currently owns the number one IP sets at both PCGS and at GC, and it's held the number one position for over four years running, and just a darn nice guy. James, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Mike. You got it. Uh, James, in December of 2009, you were featured in Coin Dealer Newsletter because you found or and eventually sold an Eisenhower dollar for how much was it? A little over $15,000. $15,000 Eisenhower dollar. You know, it's, it's amazing. My, my brother told me once made a bet with me that I couldn't talk for more than 10 minutes on Eisenhower dollars. Uh -huh. And here's proof as to absolutely why. Exactly. I was doing research for this interview, and I stumbled upon a post from Collectors Universal once where you told the story of buying the 72 Ike. You said, my best story is on a 72 P Ike. I bought the first 66 ever graded, and a 65 that was graded immediately before the 66. The 65 was a better coin. The SID sold the 66, and the profit allowed me to buy the 65. I resubmitted the coin a few years later. That coin graded 63, 64, 65, no grade, and 66. Now, the values, and this is, I think, the most important part, $5, $25, $200, $2, and eventually $6,500. The bet that I once won with my brother, which I couldn't talk about ice for 10 minutes, it turned out to be a 27 minute segment, by the way. This kind of dismissal of my dollar seems to be really prevalent in our hobby. Why do you think that's so? Well, the reality is that the Nike dollar is a very common coin. There's a lot of them out there. There's no real rare day like a Nike Crystal. There are very few coins in great condition. And when you find one that's in nice condition, everybody likes to look at the coin. But when it's really beat up, it's kind of an ugly coin. There's no question about it. And there are plenty of them that are There are plenty of beat up ones. And if you really search and you take the time to try to find them, you find out that they're really hard to uh, that's why they're really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 are just yeah. fascinating to me. Yeah. 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 that they're the only yeah. large size copper nickel, copper nickel dollar ever made by the U.S. Mint. And that fact alone makes you know, the coin interesting to me. Strike characteristics, wear patterns, and acceptance by the general, general public by way of how much they actually circulated are unique to the I dollar. How do those factors affect the supply of those coins? A lot of the coins are circulated, as you mentioned, particularly the copper number. The silver ones were all made for collectors. Most of those are really not circulated. And they're mostly in pretty nice condition, like the 
but the business strike coins did circulate quite a bit. A lot of them are very poor strikes, particularly the early years, the 71 and 72, are most all low-relief dots. So they don't have a whole lot of depth or strike to them anyway. Uh, they don't look that nice. And when you get into 73 and later years, they change the dies, and it's a much crisper die. And then the coins start to look a little bit better, a little more high relief, but they still have the problems backwards. And that's what really detracts. You get a big railroad track across the jaw. It's pretty easy to see. It's a very open coin. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that the, the 71 and 72 were packaged in that sense. So how do you go about finding stashes of those coins that are still relative quality? In today's market, it's very difficult to do. I mean, you almost need to find a shop that have rolls there for years and years. And look, there's 10 or 20 rolls, and there's some nice coins in those rolls. So you really want rolls that haven't been gone through, they haven't been circulated a lot, or I shouldn't say circulated, but they haven't been handled a lot. And you can find some key points in there. And the luster typically is going to be pretty good on those coins. The luster is retained real well. And then you go into the bags, the luster doesn't retain that well in the bag compared to the bowl. So they're a little bit harder to find nice points in the bags. Typically, those bags have been moved around a lot, so you do find quite a few bag Now, have you found with them being the copper nickel coins versus you know, any hint of silver, that the strike characteristics are, are really different? That the force that it took, the the amount of design that comes up in a strike, you know, have you found that, I mean, obviously it's more of a challenge, but have you had to develop your own kind of, of antenna for because there's nothing else that you can really compare with? You know, you're right, and you do have great ice different than any other point that's out there because it's so large. The centers of them, a lot of times, are not struck up well, and you have a lot of clockers at the other point, particularly at the outdoors, with the intensity of the design of the back. But it is really distracting. You have to allow the and the real high grades you can't have them. So you really have to learn, you know, what's acceptable in the grading company for bit made issues and what's not acceptable, particularly in the sixty six and sixty seven credits. And that's why I guess specializing in it has really helped your it's helped a ton, there's no question. Now, the, the finest known clad Ike is rated at MS6B7. You have said that an MS6B is a non existent coin. Do you still believe that statement? No, since I made that statement, they've actually created two 67 plus coins. So, in the one 67 that I thought would go 68, I sold to a customer and he got it upgraded to a 67 plus. So, maybe one day they'll grade an 8, and that might be the coin. The other coin that was graded 67 plus. I actually graded 68. I had not seen the coin at that point in time. It was a 76D Type 2 Bicentennial, which is one of the easier ones to find nice. The front of the coin absolutely was a 68, not a marketable coin. A couple of minor hits on the back of the coin, but I would have personally graded it on 68. So, very rare, obviously, but there might be one looming out there. Now, do you think that the, the lack of higher quality points is generally due to competition, quality control of the mint, disinterest in subsequent handling by mint in the system, or just a combination of the I think it's really a combination of those. It's such an open point as we talked about earlier. It's so prone to having backgrounds. Uh, yet those are those distracting factors. Anytime you have a heavy point sitting on another heavy point in the bag, you're bound to have issues. But there are a lot of striking characteristics in just Issues that make the point. There's, there's virtually no basing of the, the obverse of the point. I mean, it's, it's it really is, flat. It is very flat. And so that's always going to lend itself to a parts. No question. No question. With most modern clad points, all one has to do is purchase a mid set to own a nice mid state example of the collection. But these coins were included in mid sets in 71 and 72. So you personally. Are you still able to find a product design? It's rare that you find a sealed bag that still exists. There's a lot of bags that have been open for a long period and just stuff it back in. One of the issues is that $1.50 or $2 a piece is a good thing. People don't take special care of handling 
it's, it's almost like more dollars were years ago to certain things handles. They run them through counters. They just pump them in bags. So they don't care what they do, what they're doing, the damage wise. And you get that even with uncirculated ice because people don't care about them. Have all of the great ones already been called? I think a lot of them have. I mean, there's still some movie out there. There's no question about it. You know, I'd say probably 85% of the really nice points are probably already out there. Now, all you need to do is look at the populations of real high grade points. They do not have a whole lot of population of those points uh, each year. I mean, it's very, very good. Kind of look to see if it's been growing or decreasing over the last few years. I would surprise it's decreasing. I know there are, there are several people out there that are concentrating very hard on trying to make those numbers swell a bit. And, and there's not a lot of success, so... Exactly. When you have the spreads that you have with the dollar values in top grade, I mean, a $10,000 coin that's worth $2, three grades below, people spend time looking for that because yes. most dealers don't care about it. So there are some cherry pick opportunities out there, and, and you hear about it occasionally, and it's great for collectors when they find one of them. So. A series that lasted only eight years, 71 to 70, there are die varieties to be found in collecting. Are the varieties an important part of any set, given that the run was so short? And how difficult are they to find? The toughest dive variety is the 72P Type 2. Um, that's the modified high release reverse. It's actually a relatively rare point. I mean, if you went out and tried to find one over here that wasn't graded, you may find one or two in the whole show. So it is a tough point, and it's probably worth at least $25 or $30, even in circulating grade. In really high grade, it's a very, very good probably one of the most difficult points in the series. But there are a lot of other guy varieties and people are starting to collect those. So I think as people are more aware of what's out there, you will start getting more interest. And you'll start seeing prices rise. And there's a great book out there that was written by the Ike Group that really outlines all those guy varieties across both proof and instant points. It's a great resource. The story of the Eisenhower dollar is at the coins being needed for the casinos in Las Vegas. As the silver dollars were used in dollar slot machines, they were worth far more than a dollar, and they were being called by the papers, you know, those establishments. Is there any basis to those stories? Did these coins that never actually see these casinos? They did. They definitely saw use early on in the casinos before all the electronic machines were out there. Um, and there were quite a few out there. I guess in the olden days, you actually had real silver dollars in the machine. Obviously, when the silver prices started rising, it was easy to put a knife in there because it was the same size, and it was worth a dollar. So there's definitely uh, some truth to that. And that is the source of a lot of the heavily circulated points. Do you think that the Ike dollar may be the best pursuit for a budget collector in terms of potential values? It's a great set for a budget collector. In fact, that's how I got started with Ike's, because I was a budget collector when I didn't have any money. And I said, boy, I'd really like to put a nice looking set of these together. And that's when I realized how difficult it really is to find them in high grade. Even the mid state points, to find a really perfect point, took me years to find those points. And a budget collector can actually put a pretty high value set together if they take their time looking at it. So the answer is yeah, absolutely. It's a great series for budget collectors, and it's a great series for advanced collectors as well. So you learn a little bit more about it, you specialize in it, you know, and you can make some You can make some serious money with that, that's for sure. James, it's been great fun having you, and we've really enjoyed hearing your story. I've long been a proponent of collecting modern points, and the opportunity that collecting these points can provide. Thank you so much for coming by Very good. and for sharing your love of what I think may be one of the least expected U.S. points of all time. Sounds good. We'll work on changing that. Thanks, Thank Mike. Take Thanks. care. Thanks. Bye. If you're not a game member, hey. the Coin Show wants to make you one. Tweet us on Twitter, drop us a note on Facebook, or email us at like or Matt at coinshowradio.com and we'll sponsor your first year of gold membership with the AM. This membership includes 12 monthly, monthly issues of the Numismatist magazine on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Free admission to the ANA World's Fair Money and National Money Shows, direct submissions to NGC. Discounts and membership benefits or discounts to Wizard Coin Supply, savings on shipping, insurance, and much, much more. 
Enjoy all of these membership benefits for free when the Coin Show sponsors your first year membership in the ANA. Just get in touch by Twitter, Facebook, or email and join a nation of collectors courtesy of the Coin Show. Joining us now, Rick Snow is an author and possibly one of the foremost authorities on flying eagle and Indian head suits in the known universe. In 1992, he wrote his first book, Flying Eagle and Indian Head Sense. In 1994, along with a partner, Brian Wagner, he created the Pink Sheet Value Guide, a reference used by both collectors and dealers of Indian Head and Flying Eagle Sense to this day. He is also a coin connoisseur and dealer. He is the owner of Eagle Eye Rare Coins. IndianHeadSense.com, he is also a really, really great guy. Please welcome Rick Snow. Hey, thanks a lot. Rick, when did you start collecting coins? Oh, 1972. A long time ago. I joined the A&A in 1976. 1970, okay. So, when when did your your love of coins develop into dealing? Uh, oh, 1976. <laughs> so, I love money. No, that's okay. There's a lot of us to do. What is it of, in particular about it in that sense, flying eagle sense, that fascinates you? Uh, well, it's a series that uh, covers a great period of history, from the pre-Civil War until the time of Teddy Roosevelt, and everything in between. It's, it's just great. And in my book, I put a lot of history So it's not just in my book about dye varieties or what have you, or that's just, uh, but we learn a lot about what was going on in the financial world, political world, and all around. You know, many dealers that I know don't collect coins themselves as the most desirable stuff that they find will fetch the best prices for the business bottom line. That in the end for business. Which side do you fall on? Do you collect more or dealer? Do you have a private collection? No, I collect information. Okay. So, and resell. And I saw the coins. And um, I typically tell some of my customers, I say, well, I own all the coins, I just rent them out. Well, come back. I want the back. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Indian head set? Um, yeah, uh, I do. Uh, it, it, just while well, flying eagle. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, favorite one would be uh, the uh, 1857 with the uh, flash mark on it from a 20 L gold piece. I read a piece in your book on that. Yeah. You showed where the die clash was. And it's, it, it's, it's a real mind bender of how the variety happened. And if you could find one, you could pop a lot of money. So that's one to keep a lookout for. Yeah. Do you prefer the copper nickel to the brass equipment? No. Either or. They, they, either or they, they, I find the brass or the copper brass are good. Same brass. But, are have a much more uh, personality to them. Okay. All the different toning, what have you. And so no two are exactly alike. And you know, reds and browns in between. And, uh, so it makes it much more uh, interesting. A, a very popular story is told of James Longacre, the designer of the Indian Hills, and how he may have modeled, modeled the opera's design after his young daughter, Sarah. Do you think that that story has any truth? Uh, you know, inspired maybe, because we found it uh, in research for my book, I found a drawing to the sketchbook of his daughter that looks like he had, he had uh, uh, on, the, on all of his coins, actually, delivery on all of his coins. Uh, the, the family, who uh, I'm familiar with many people in his family, uh, they have what's called the long acre nose, which is the straight kind of nose that comes down. So it's a distinctive characteristic for the family, but uh, it's also, uh, you know, he could have taken you know, off of statues like he, he said he did. Uh, we'll never know, really. Uh, I have a picture in my book of the uh, sketch. It is, it is a very classic and I love it, but it's not just culture, it's just class. I guess the origin would be up and it would be it would be a bit conjecture. Um, the original reverse design had a laurel wreath and no shield. And then the second year they went to an oak wreath 
with the shield. Why do you think that after one year that's Well, uh, that was recommended by uh, James Stoke, the director, as uh, they wanted to have a point with a more national character. And that's a so the first Union thing. shield at the top was yeah. Right. Yeah. And this was before the Civil War uh, broke out, but uh, still they wanted just having a uh, it's actually an olive wreath. Paul Floral was stoked in his book that it's an olive wreath. Um, but uh, um, it, it was just a, a, a whim of the mint director. And it, the new design I have to say is beautiful and not quite as stark. Yes, the olive, right? Yes. But there are a number of uh, 1859 uh, Indians with that same reverse in 1860. They made about a thousand of them. And there's a very interesting thing going on right now in the hobby as to whether these are actual patterns or regular issues that were very, very limited issue. And uh, so that's one of the things that we discussed today in the flying coin club, the flying club. And uh, right now, uh, people like Dave Bowers is pushing to get it in the Red Book. And, uh, you know, so and, and, uh, the editor of the Red Book, Kendra said, is like, well, I have to be very careful about this, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, so it's very interesting to uh, this uh, kind of thing evolving today. It's, it's not, nothing is always set in stone. No. It it's, may be a coin that you might need for your coin collection. And you know just where they can find I know where they can find something. Now, is, is the reverse of 1860, the, or I should say, the 1853 coins, are they scientifically constructed? Well, they've been listed in the Jug Book as a pattern, Jug 228, uh, back in 1959. Back in 1958, uh, they were listed in the White Raven State as regular issues. But the red book is not that the catalog that you're turning down. So now, the red book is not the red book. It does not exist. Because Kemperset has one dollar. They got it. In my opinion, I don't know if it's not the story. I mean, they are two distinct points. You know, do most collectors cross over in this series? Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe not so much of proofs, because the proof flying eagles are very expensive. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly the flying eagles themselves uh, are a nice collection. I personally was collecting flying eagles uh, as a uh, collection at least one time. Yeah, I thought it would make a nice small collection, but it would be kind of huge. <laughs> it's amazing. Because it's a lot of variety. There's a lot of yeah, stuff. A lot of stuff. stuff. All Indian headsets were struck in Philadelphia before 1901. With only one coin per year of issue, does this limit interest in the series, or are there varieties that that expanded that one would expect to be able to collect? With this oh series? yeah, there's a lot of varieties. My new book uh, is now uh, coming out in uh, a few months. It's 900 pages. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. But um, uh, this, uh, there's, for many of the years, there's really neat varieties of like double dyes, green peach dates, things like that, that a lot of people get into, especially when they uh, uh, find out how mysterious some of them were in their creation. Like there's one, uh, 1880 has a, an offset flash mark. Uh, it's straight through the reverse, you can see images of the opera's eye. And you think, how did this happen? And it's a very mysterious point. Even other experts don't understand how it was uh, coming about. But it's, the answer is that I have. Okay, well, <laughs> we'll be anxiously awaiting that. Many proof sense was strong, but yet many people have never seen one. Is that thing that I can cost for No, but there, there's no, no cheap ones. They're going to cost you four or five hundred bucks. Okay. But, but they're all real super well strong and you don't want to skim on uh, proof because they were made to, be, to look nice and you don't want an ugly one. There's no one else <laughs> That's good to like this. I'm collecting advice for everything. Now, the men sold sets of Indian headset pattern coins in 1850. Mm -hmm. NGC said that they were sold in sets of 12. 
How many sets of these patterns do you think still exist today? Uh, the, the original sets, uh, but, but uh, the last one that I know of is the Lionsburg collection. It's supposedly an original set, but I don't know. Um, but it's a, people, it's a really popular set for people to put together. Back. I think they minted about 75 complete sets. And that includes the uh, 50, uh, 58 small letter proof. Uh, and then uh, the popularity of uh, certain ones was found in a pretty strong life. Uh, of course, the adopted issue was made at a lot higher numbers. They got through that. And since I guess they're not numbered or anything, can you tell me whether they're in an original set? Well, I've, 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 done, I've, well, I've done dice studies. It might be possible to figure out which ones are the first one. Uh, and so it's in the book. And I, I keep putting my thing here. Yes. Uh, this is, uh, in addition to a hardcover book, what I have is uh, the uh, PDF version, which people can order too. And it's much easier to take this to a foreign show than you can order it for me. Well, after the book is out, I stopped because I, I stopped uh, selling it for a while. Because, uh, but you can take this to your coin show and nine minutes. Yeah. This is the this is the way of the future. Well, can you get us the uh, address for the site? Oh it'll be uh okay. Indi IndianCent.com. IndianCent.com. And the price will probably be you know, it's like sixty five. Indian headsets were at one time the most plentiful points in circulation in the United States. Since then they've all pretty much been all in circulation. Has that hurt the market for me? No, no, actually it makes it more interesting because most people haven't seen it. And when they see one, it's like, oh wow, how much is that? And I say, it's a dollar. Oh my god, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> so I, I, I say I got another one for ten thousand dollars. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> there are many counterfeit Indian headsets. Is there any advice that you'd offer to new collectors and students? Uh well read my books because I go into counterfeits on those. There's some real deceptive ones. The ones that are coming from China right now, which you can you know, buy uh those, uh, those Chinese places uh, are not too deceptive, but they are getting better and uh, you really shouldn't know what you're dealing with. Absolutely. Okay, now my, my last question I guess. Where do you turn to when you don't know the answer to your question on the answers? Where does Rick Snow go? Well, I don't know how to figure it out. <laughs> well, that was, I was trying to find other experts on, it, on the series, and it seems like virtually everything comes from Rick Snow. So yeah. I was just wondering, where does Rick Snow go? When I, I, I figure it out. I figure it out. I figure that's why I make my own answers. So you have a new writing project in the works. You're, you're working. Yeah, it's 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 called the Flying uh, Eagle and Indian Set Attribution Guide. It's actually uh, a, a third edition. Uh, the second edition came out ten years ago, and it's a four volumes I combined it, and now it's 900 pages. But this will be hardcover and uh, two volumes. And, uh, it's a real big book, but we. We started a thing on Kickstarter. We Kickstarter yes. uh, to fund the book. And right now it's going on until go uh, the end of the month. We have to raise uh, forty-two thousand five hundred dollars to get the thing printed. It's, it's an expensive book, and um, so we're getting lots of pledges. Uh, we're about a quarter of the way there after a week, and um, I'm telling people here. Well, we wish you continued success. Thank right, you thank so you. much for stopping by. Right. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Rick Snow. Hey, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. The a and National Light Show is rolling into Portland this spring, March 5th through the 7th. This show will feature world-class displays from the Edward C. Rochette Money Museum and a host of private collection, free convention seminars, and the only popular collector's exhibits area, and of course, more filled with more than 500 dealers looking to buy, sell, and trade. Save the dates now, March 5th through 7th. It's the ANA National Money Show in Portland, Oregon. See you there. Joining us now, our good friend and 
host here. <laughs> he is the, the marketing director of the American Numismatic Association, Jake Sherlock. Thank you so much for stopping by. Glad to be here. Very glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, just like to give a little shout out to Matt. Uh, thank you for timing the uh, birth of your child around this time so that uh, I can sit in the chair for you. So. <laughs> He's always I've, I've always wanted to be Matt. So, you know, it's like yeah, I, get to, I get to play Matt now. So, so you pick on me? Yeah, I guess I do have to pick on you a little bit. And, and you have to pick on me back. It so. goes along with the, with yeah, the territory. Absolutely. So, okay. <laughs> we've, been, we've been talking all spring on our show about the brand okay. new org. I know, right? And with bated breath, our, our listeners have been enduring my teasing. <laughs> there is now a place where they can go and see the finished product. It is it is live as we speak. We actually uh, unveiled the Friday before the pro show started. Uh, we actually took it live kind of quietly. We haven't even issued our press release yet, so you're kind of getting a big scoop here on the Coin Show live broadcast, and it's there if you haven't noticed it already. Uh, but the reason why we did we did kind of a quiet, what we call a soft launch. Uh, the main reason for that was, you know, not to uh, not to overwhelm the new website. You know, we paid. You know, we we've, we've really upgraded our technology at the ANA over the last three years that I've been there. We've done a lot of upgrades with our web technology. One of the big things that we did with this new website is we no longer host it in-house. The old website lived on a machine that was in the building, and if for some reason, you know, the power went out in downtown Colorado Springs, the website went down too. Um, that was a bit of a problem. Um, now we, we've taken the website, we actually host it uh, with, a, with a hosting company. Um, we decided to still just be cautious with the soft launch, didn't want to overwhelm anything, but, you know, the, the, the place where we're hosting it and, and what we're doing with our, our hosting contract, feasibly you should be able to put everything in there on that website at one time and it should be fun. So, but we didn't want to find out the hard way, so we, you know, we did the soft launch. So. Well, I have to say from a stylistic standpoint that I really, really appreciated the difference Thanks. between the old site and the new site. There is, it's, it's more alive. It, it translates to different formats. Well, I look at it on my phone, and I can get you know all sorts of places on the site. It's very friendly to tablets and to PCs. You know, it, it's something that, that seems to be much more 21st century. It, it definitely is. You know, I, I always used to joke with the old money dot org um, was probably designed before cell phones were invented. Um, certainly before smartphones were invented. Um, and uh, if they might have even been before the, before the car. I'm not sure about that. But, um, no, I kid. But uh, it was it was definitely out of date. You know, it had a it had a very old feel to it. The thing that I really like about the new website is it emphasizes visuals. You can really see those points nice and up close and personal. A great example of that. If you've ever checked out our monthly YN auctions. On the old website, you know, you can see the points that we had for auction for the YNs, and you know, it was it was okay. Uh, the the person who's in charge of our YN auctions online, her name is Lauren Spring, she's our communications coordinator, and she absolutely rocks. She did a great job with the old website, but now with the new one, we get so much more size and detail on those photos. You can really get a, a, a good glimpse of what we're what we're offering in those auctions, and that extends through the whole site. So if you see, you know, a uh, a photo of something that we have in the museum showcase. You're going to get that in such better detail than we ever could before on the site. The site is really impressive with, with all the different things that it has. Now, I was talking shortly before the show to Walt Ostromecki, and he was telling me that what excites him the most is a uh, searchable database of numismatist articles that is going to be available not quite yet, but in the not too distant future. That was a uh, that was a project that we just started launching right as we were finishing up the old website. Uh, the new business is online. It has been online since 2009. Uh, you can go back and dig through the archives all the way back to 2009. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going all the way back to all the way back 127 years, all the way back to issue one. Uh, the by Dr. George Heath, and yeah, they're all coming. That's something. It's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, you know, we're going to start with some of the newer issues that have, you know that come from you know actual electronic publication, what we call pagination in the business. So basically, magazines that were put together with computers, those are the ones that are going to be easier to get up because we have those electronically still. 
if you go back to the ones that were put out, you know, before computers, those are the ones we actually have to scan, or we're going to have them all scanned. But eventually, they're all going to be there. We're looking at sometime next year. So it's, it's, it's a pretty big lot. volume of work. But yeah, it's going to be great when we have them all up there, all the way back to the shoe one. Because you're going to be able to go in and you can look it up by author, by name of the, the article, by subject. Right. It's going to be cross-referenceable database of everything that's ever been published in the business. That's, yeah. that's that's a big undertaking, but it's it's a really big gift to the hobby. It is. It's it's a really big. It, it, it you know I mean the, the size of that the size and scope of that project is really quite huge. But it's going to be a huge payoff for the membership. I mean, you're going to have 127 years worth of research with the business articles, worth of, if you want to go back and look at like some of the old advertisements, which could be kind of fun. You know what? Remember going to those advertising in the 1940s, you know? Um, there's just going to be so much back there to discover that, you know, you can come and you can poke through the archives at the, at the A&A library in Colorado Springs and see some of that stuff, but now you're going to be able to pull it up from your computer or smartphone or tablet. And uh, we're just we're just really excited about that project. So it, it sounds like a really exciting project. And we're really really happy to have been one of the people or one of the venues that you've been able to hike this. Oh, absolutely! And you guys have been wonderful with uh, with telling your uh, listeners about it, as well as uh, helping bring some new listeners into the A and A. So you guys have sponsored a lot of memberships over the last year. We really appreciate you doing that. That's All great. This has been way more than great. There's at least three in the last week. <laughs> well, thank you, Jake. Thanks for stopping by and thanks for telling us about the new website. Uh, we really appreciate you stopping by. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. And look, we'll bring in our last guest. Dennis Tucker is a publisher of Whitman Publishing. Whitman publishes the absolute best books about the hobby of coin collecting, not only in my opinion, but in the opinions of many others. Not only do they publish the Guidebook of United States Coins, the Red Book, as it's known, they also publish the Bauer series of Red Books to cover, cover individual uh, coin types in depth. In my estimation, they are the best reference works in our hobby. And if you own any coin books, I would be willing to wager that more than one of those books that you own was published by Whitman. Now, anyone who knows Dennis personally is aware that he is a lover of coins, coin collecting, and coin collectors in general. He has an incredible sense of wit. I have been privy to stories about a certain vending machine that only accepts and dispenses rare coins. He has an incredible skill with the written word. And they also know that just as a true Southern gentleman should be, Dennis is a really Really nice guy. Please welcome to our show, Dennis Tuck. See, thanks. Dennis, you were a guest on our maiden voyage last year, so we're glad to have you back. You're the only one that actually would accept the, the dare. Um, in the intervening months, I have seen Whitman publish a vast number of books about coins and other numismatic items. One of which I was particularly interested in was in addition to your flagship, a guidebook of United States coins. This one published as the essential edition. Now, I read the press release as well as the book, but I couldn't quite get the flavor of what exactly the difference was in this edition you know, versus the other editions. I examined them you know, side by side really closely. I couldn't find a bad. Can you tell me more about this book? Well, basically, the big difference is that it's distribution. Uh, people who buy the essential edition are getting essentially the right book. Uh, we stripped out some of the front of the book material, colonials, uh, some of the back of the book material, token, historical and things like that. But if you're looking for access to double eagles, coverages, getting all of that, that uh, deep in the red right book, the distribution is in more than big box retail stores. So our, our strategy is to get, uh, get the red right book, a lot of people return this, and I will have it. Uh, into the hands of the audience right now, otherwise, especially as a lot of the big boxes are looking like to take out the considerations and have to keep some excellent niche work, whereas the essential niche work is not going to be able to have that information. It's kind of an oversized magazine, which uh, the retailers have done well with it. 
So it's, it's just a format issue, and uh, it helps us get the word out about the hobby to uh, and, it, and it can be told by my inability to distinguish it from the other. It, it has an amazing amount of position. Uh, it's amazing how you continue to innovate the record. You have a spiral bound edition that lays flat when you're looking at stuff off. Professional edition, leather bound regular edition, a hidden spiral edition, the blue book, and now the essential edition. Is the guy who's your biggest seller? It is. It really is. We've sold uh, a little more than 23 million copies since 1946. Where does that make among the greatest sellers of hobby books of all time? Oh, I, I would say it's number one. Okay. In the, in the hobby community, definitely. And, and even among non fiction titles of all kinds within the United States or the U.S. publisher, uh, it's, it's definitely a great effort. There have been years where it's ranked something like number nine or number six. You know, I, I sell enough. That is amazing. Whitman seems to produce a large number of successful series books. The guidebook is a series of its own here after. The Red Book or Bauer series, which continues to expand, is 16 volumes today. The 100 Greatest Series, the books on Golden Eagles, both silver and a gold platinum volume, as well as the Jack Pickles series. What can you attribute the popularity of these series? And can we expect more to come in the Bauer series? Yes. Uh, to answer the second question first, yes, we can expect more of the Bauer series. And it's interesting, I, with the Bauer series, we Try to capitalize on the most popular Give today's collectors what, what most of them are interested in. Uh, but as you've seen, we've started to get into uh, more esoteric subjects, civil war tokens, where we see the interest of the uh, More and more people getting into the hobby uh, and into that very specialized field. Uh, art types tokens. Another day follows uh, David Lee uh, technically works on uh, half eagles, eagles. Uh, he's done gold dollars and gold he's done double eagles. Um, all of the great World War II era, the World War I era, I should say, uh, Renaissance of American Primitive type of uh, the standard you asked why the Republicans do so well, because people people love the coins. Uh, but I, I think also with respect to collective mentality, I, I think most people that, you know, if you've got numbers of both through 15 16 dollars set, you've got to be able There is that compulsion to want to complete the set. I, and I know you're that way. Like, yes, if, I if, you come up with a guy who opened up points by your sense or something, you might have that on your phone. I have to have another thing, yes. <laughs> Now, you covered the gamut in material for both coin and book collectors. Um, Michael Miles Standish recently wrote a brand new book on Morgan Collins. Crumb, Unger, and Oxman recently released a third edition on their Crescent City Morgan. Edmund Roy wrote a book on American Golden Platinum Eagles. Arthur and Ira Friedberg gave us the fourth edition of the United States Paper Money. There was a new Bowers series book on Civil War Tokens, written by the Dean of Numismatics himself, KDB. And another where he teamed up with 10% to write a short paperback reference entitled Buffalo Coins America's Favorite. Yes. Now, Dennis, for many publishers, that would be a good run for a few years. <laughs> but for you, that was just the tip of the iceberg in a single year. How do you find so many great venues to grow still on Well, Dave Powell's course is kind of going on himself. Uh, he's, he's got books for Hopper coming up with books that uh, actually I. Along. And you are the first non women to see it. <laughs> and you might be familiar with the title. This is actually, uh, it's not an update and, as such of Dave's classic. It's really a, we're calling it Golden Anniversary. He's got 50 plus chapters. He's going to tell a great story about coins, tokens, paper money. You know, I really would date it. Any of those chapters make itself a mechanic. Uh, but uh, outside of Dave Bauer, it's going to have great authors and people with great knowledge of the hobby. Our ad boy is a major Obviously, a ton of behind the scenes knowledge about the American Indian program. 
Miles Standish, first president of the CG Act, probably was paid 10 million coins in some time, uh, and that Campbell had studied a lot of priorities. So, um, you know, we can, we can take very popular subjects like working dollars and put them up under another book about miracles. We've always got authors who have a new way to approach to take specialized knowledge and to take them. Uh, with Miles, he interviewed John Love. Long time with the Bell Dealer and brought up some of his observations on the full time market. Uh, so, you know, we've got the classic subjects and we've got great authors, and that's where a lot of these ideas are. The stable of authors that you keep is, is really quite amazing in and of itself. Um, I, I was amazed to find that you, know, you have a big boy, John Mercanti, who you know, used to be a great book of it, all the way to KCGS and Dave Bowers has probably forgotten more about the whites than I'll ever know. Um, and and it, it is such a blessing to the hobby that this man has decided to write down everything he knows and to share it. Because, you know, the volumes and volumes of stuff that you produce every single year, you know, there's always something new and there's always an interesting angle on it. And there's always something different for people to pick up on. It's just it's amazing. Um, to be fair, Whitman publishes books on many hobby subjects, not just coins. You also publish books about currency that are just as in-depth, just as rich, just as fanatical as some of the coin books. You know, I was on your website and I saw books about stamp collecting, motorcycles, gemstones, movie posters, and one that wasn't quite like the other. Tell me about Jim Murray's whiskey vibe. <laughs> what draws a publisher like Whitman to that particular book? Well, you know, there's... If I may sort of synergy, throw that around. There's a, there's a, I think there's a big connection, a strong connection between uh, collectors, the joy, the artistry, the parody, the beauty of American employees. And you have that kind of intellectual interest and the uh, resources to, to copy the things uh, or collect the wine, collect the motorcycles. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, similarities where I probably start collecting both cards, collecting whatever your magical cards or, or what can be. There's that intellectual part um, for other interests, and you know, there's a lot of connection. So the risky opportunity can be you know, it's, it's a market that's uh, that's growing, it's very passionate, it's very vibrant. Uh, Hobbyists so who trust his heart and point to enjoy the whiskey of experience. So, Now, I review books and I'm always on the lookout for new ones. There are a few publishers that have success publishing books, a lot of coin collecting or hobby subjects in general. I am absolutely impressed that every year we've been publishing several really great references that almost instantly become the classics that people turn to on a subject. How do you keep on turning out these classics year after? How long is the development process for it? It varies by the type. Um, someone like Dave Bauer is a very prolific author. He's been writing for a long time and researching for a long time. He has extensive uh, research files that he can draw on. So if we asked him to, to write a book on old half emails, you know, it would take him probably two months. You know, concentrated effort to come up with an entire manuscript. A book that starts from scratch, uh, I'm supposed to use Ed Murray's book as an example. Uh, you know, just kind of ballpark it a year from, from the start of the manuscript to uh, editorial, uh, designing the book, laying it out, proofing what's been laid out, making the corrections on it. We saw a big demand from his fans for printing. And so we came up with one of our development which is a fan of science publication, and a number of millions on the site. And I believe we did that in a matter of about six years. Which is to take that's getting attorneys involved to make sure that 
as usual, the longest part of the drive. Right. Yeah, yeah. The whole team came to that. We had people from New York applied. I was actually on vacation up in New York at the time. I kind of managed things and things like that. Uh, but that, that's the experience. Uh, if someone comes to us with a concept, and they feel like they need it there to write their fleet to manuscript test, but it's just a little bit easier to be able to have it for 2015 or 2016. A big portion of people will always have books on the next publishing place in the body, or it's just planned on several years in advance. Now, one of the things that I think is characteristic of Whit and the books that you publish is the illustration. The illustrations of Whit the books are, are they're rich, they're, they're, they're really well suited to the material. Has there ever been kind of a, a backdoor way, a book that kind of came about from the illustration standpoint? Well, you know, there's, I, I can think of some books that have more picture book than you will. The greatest series certainly is well known for having uh, picture book books and just wonderful auxiliary art, but also gigantic photographs of the books. Uh, but really, uh, you need a solid story uh, to, to back it up. You need the history, the history. Um, Dick Tony is an asset for not uh, American bankers of the 1800s. Um, pictures from the history. That's, uh, I mean, you could almost look at that as a picture, but of course, his prose is what makes it. He's, he's just wonderful narrative and, and uh, great storytelling. And the way he analyzes America through the vignettes on our particular day and what that says about our country. Um, it's, uh, it's a combination. And that, that's what makes a great book. Yeah, I would love to to have access to to the archives of the pictures that you have done because it's quite impressive. I have to say, yeah. I have to say that, that would be just that would be future all of its own. Um, now, you see new works by dollars who were set seemingly almost every year. But there are some newer dates that are coming to the forefront. Who does Dennis Tucker recommend we read if we want to discover the next great this man? <laughs> You're going to put me in the spot. I, sure. Well, <laughs> well I, you know, we know that you have this table of stalwarts. These are, these are the people that are there. Those are your front runners every year. Yeah. But there's got to be some new people. I know you're constantly cultivating talent. Yes. Should we watch more? I you can expect to see more books from Miles Candish. Uh, you know, he's got uh, just a huge wealth of knowledge in, in uh, American business matters. Uh, Jeff Garrett is really, um, I mean, it, it's its not even proper to call him up and coming because he's been a uh, he's been a time. Uh, uh, yeah, and he's been a dealer forever. But, uh, but he's, he's very active in the National Business Matters Collection. And, and he's actually become something of a mentor and a Christian for other thinkers as well. Mike Moran has a book that's coming out with people that are going on. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt and Augustus St. Paul is a great relationship. He's actually going to go down in 1849. Shining a new light on a message of having California gold rush the birth of those different people. So, uh, Ed Boyd probably has a few more books in there. Probably, just yeah. a couple. John McCarthy as well. I mean, all, all of these guys have been, uh, been working with over the past five, six, seven years. I, I was looking at my my own personal list of uh, working authors for the last 10 years that I've been working for, and brought on board 50 new authors. You know, people who were not looking at authors before, and that's everyone from, from uh, Cornelius to Rule. To Art and Ira Friedberg, you know, big names in the hobby, but they were never put in authors. You know, Ted Dosper, the new folks that came, uh, Rick Tamaska, and so many places put in off now. And our friend Beth Dyche. David Lang, Beth Dyche is now on board. Yes, yeah. The second edition of her book just came out. Yes, and that. We were talking about that earlier. Okay, right. Yes. Okay. Yes. I don't know if she told you, but what kind of first person outside of her? She told me that she received her copy at 5 o'clock last night. Probably. Yes. Right. She, was, she had like one foot out, out the court of the airport. She was coming here. And, and that, thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, are there any new books on the grass that you can tell us about? Yeah. Well, you know, we have our, our ongoing project with uh, uh, Absolute Paper. 
which will come out with volumes one and two. Uh, volume three will come out very early next year. That's on uh, Massachusetts. Uh, and then we'll finish up the way with the Rhode Island and Vermont uh, a little later. Now, this goes all back, way back to the colonial paper money? Well, there, this is the, the, the big oh, okay, art size. Uh, okay. Eight and a half by 11. Um, uh, we had a volume one. Uh, stop by the booth if you have it. Okay, so then I will stop by. And like we're the fourth because they're, they're, they're substantial. They're substantial. They're ten pounds. It's very well paid. But eventually we'll cover all of the states, uh, cities, towns, and states that issue an absolute paper from 1792 to 1867. Just a huge undertaking. Yeah, because everything back then was, was all done by local banks. There was no national right. state charter bank. It was all state free federal was free uh, national banks. You've got, uh, you've got a great book coming up on Mexican money. And this has been, we actually publicized, started publicizing this book a couple years ago, and, which was ambitious. We probably sort of held off. But it's one of those books with a million moving parts, as I say. Uh, Don and Rose Kelly are the authors. And they've been working with Mexican coin dealers, coin collectors, people who make Mexico, the Mexican League, uh, and other specialists, museums, and other organizations. And this is actually volume one of a four volume encyclopedia. So it's, it's just, it's going to be another monumental, huge book that we can do. Very, very exciting. I, I'm excited about it. We've started to get into Canadian coins as well. So we hope to energize Mexico. A couple more in the 100 greatest, uh, we're updating the 100 greatest U.S. bottle companies. Uh, that'll be the store edition of the And the 100 greatest U.S. bottle companies, the store edition. So we have Jeff Perry and Scott Shepard. I, I'm actually ready for myself. I, we, we've done the uh, American Silver Eagles, and we've done American Gold and Plan in uh, I'm going to do Palladium Eagles. It's more of a one sheet. No, no, I, I'm actually doing a, a book on, uh, on American Arts Gold Medallions, uh, the 2000 uh, Wildlife Conservation Medals, which everything else in the U.S. we has done in gold and silver medallions. Other than the Greeks, it was sort of first spouse uh, uh, gold coins and things like that. So just to, to kind of serialize the cover, right? just to round things off. Exactly. Yes. Everything is covered. Up. So this is going to be authored by Dennis Tucker. Yeah. To yeah. The blue side of this, like, it's going to be a tough negotiation with this. Well, you know, I, I told, I was talking to Ed Moy the other day, and I told him I'm never going to push you over an author again. I'm never going to like send you a dunning email to like, hey, are you done yet? Because now I know how hard it is. It's, and I don't know, I, and I appreciate even more how Dave Bowler, you know, what Dave Bowler is. Yes. It's great. We, we've got a book on John F. Kennedy, in Alabama, uh, which I think we would be really proud of. As you've seen here at the show, uh, timing wants to be perfect. <laughs> right. Uh, William Rice is an author. He's a longtime Kennedy historian. Uh, he's very passionate about you know, everything Kennedy. He's got medals, tokens, world coins, uh, gold coins, U.S. coins. He's basically picking up where Ed Rochette left off in the 1960s and Aubrey Mayhew and other researchers and bringing them together. So he's got, he's got illustrated catalogs, he's got the index of the uh, He talks about the value of those. So it was something uh, for the Kennedy experience. Which is something that there could be more work on. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively recent series, so it hasn't been the time you know, to develop this kind of thing. So. And, and, and really, this is, yeah, this is a book that's um, taking research that kind of died off over the years and has not been compiled in single stories. Of course, we're illustrating the full book. I would be talking photographs and, uh, and you know, stories and photographs of the costume and things. Really, like you said, tying together the illustration to the event. Uh, we have a book by Robert Shipman from Pleasure and Profit, and that is. Um, his kind of storytelling and analysis of how he built and 
because the sword is wet on the collection of the rest of the It's basically a collection. And it's kind of warts in all analysis. So he doesn't sugarcoat it. He made mistakes. He talks about them. Educating the today's collector about how to avoid those mistakes by Marcel. He tells about what he did right. And it's just, it's a, he's, a, he's a great storyteller, too. Uh, and he checks a little bit to it. A lot of golf analogies. I'm not golf myself, but I like the jokes and things about it. So, uh, you know, this is, I think this is going to be a really popular book. So it's kind of weird. You can enjoy it from storytelling. But he's basically got about 150 uh, bullet points and lessons to learn from his experience. I, I think that's one of the, one of the things that makes a lot of books enjoyable is that, yes, they cover a lot of material, and yes, you can learn an awful lot with them, but yet they make it more human, and they, they read something that, that just brings enjoyment to it, that, that makes it a little bit more than just reading about something. If you wanted to publish a book that's just a catalog, and point by point study of dive variety, just as well as you could, uh, frankly, I think that's a mistake in these days. Those readers expect they expect they want to be engaged. They want to be engaged. They, they like the stories, they like the history. Um, you know, that's the that's the successful books that we found. Uh, not not just giving a point by point study. Yeah, yeah, of course. But uh, there's so much more. And uh, I, I think readers today expect a lot of that level of detail and human interest. Like, I, I could go on and on if you want. We've got, the, Dave Bowers is, is updating his uh, back in the Civil War tokens already. I, I know. It just came out last year. They, they keep issuing more tokens. No, no. It's, uh, what he's doing is he, he's updating, he's got 14 pages on the Civil War which is kind of a subset of the Yes. We, we, did a, we did a segment on the Civil War Okay. I'm well on the Oh, good. Yes. So, you know, I, I, there's never been anything like that in a kind of mainstream, mass distributed So, we're taking the opportunity. It's a good place for it to put it in. Yeah, you know, it, it makes sense. For sure. We saw that we've got uh, this book, the first edition sold very well. It sold out. We had to go back to the press you know, for another print run. And, and yet another, and we decided, let's. Instead of just reprinting, let's update the prices, um, you know, toss in any new resource we have to play, and then give Dave a forum for it. See, I can imagine this book, if Dave calls you up right after publishing the book, where he's like, you know, Dennis, there's, there's something else that I'd really like to add to it. You <laughs> just publish this book. He could probably give us 96 pages, but we're going to pull it back to 48. Uh, Dave is actually working on an update of his coin treasures and gold's book, which was very popular back in the day. Um, so he'll be updating that with all the uh, <laughs> ship wreck information that's coming to light in recent weeks. Um, and that will probably end up getting people on his coins and collectors book where if you're just expecting what's going to be the two years, you're going to some things and all that's going to totally blow the old book out of the water. And, and his old books, of course, are the classics, and it's a certain facility. A lot of people who are into the hobby, um, they, they tell the stories, they get kids from the time, and things like that. So, and I, I think the treasures and rules are the same thing. It's, you know, it's, tell, it's storytelling, it's, it's pirate treasure, it's you know, shipwrecks. And, that is fascinating. Yeah. Those are the kind of things that draw new collectors. It really does. <laughs> stories. Stories of the stage room drives, stories of the shipwrecks, the treasure hunts, you know, things of that nature. Do you personally have a favorite book? It does I, I, a good book. I love them all equally. You just know, like children. <laughs> That's right. Just, just, like, just children. like children. I, I think uh, it's hard not to get excited about the most recent ones, too, which is kind of coming off the excitement of putting together what it has. I'm really very impressed with the books on Absolute Radio. And I wish I, I brought some to show you if you haven't seen it yet. I'll, I'll have to stop by. Check it. 
Yeah, that's good for some. Don't, don't try to, like, uh, don't try to take the moment of luggage because you go over the weight in the time frame. But, um, the, these are books that, that touch on every, uh, every city on, you know, this side of the country um, that, that issued this, this paper. So, um, you know, from the way in down to the mid Atlantic and South Atlantic states. Um, every town, it's got the history of the town, it's got the history of Pennsylvania. So, it's, I see these as really more separate. They're more than just the collectors for American historians. And uh, it, it, it tells the story of the type of money that a lot, even, even American historians and economists would not know about Because you can ask an economic historian, uh, and David's with this historian for talking about the money. Prominent Civil War historians ask him, What do you know about money in the Civil War? And his answer was, Well, I know that eventually Confederate money was worthless to me. Didn't know anything about you know, the, the huge revolution in uh, federal appointed federal paper money. I uh, didn't know anything about Civil War. So, uh, I, and you and I have talked about this before. I like books that do that, that kind of bridge the gap. Mainstream American history, if you will, and news about history, and everything that goes into it. I think Fred Lee's books did that, and Abraham Lincoln covered it. I think James Cable did that as well. The question that I get an opportunity to interview publishers very rarely what are you reading right now? What am I reading? What are you reading? Gosh. Obviously, I do a lot of reading of like numismatic titles. Yes. Um, I like to go to Goodwill and pick up books uh, for like a couple bucks each. And, and also, I actually, I actually was just last week. I picked up a book on Jewish humor, kind of enough, and a scholarly study for Jewish humor. So, you know, it's interesting. What else did I get? Um, I got a book on uh, how to prepare and give a speech. You know, because I'll be giving some presentations here in the show. So I'm sure. I think, you know, day before, maybe I should hold up on that. Yeah, that, that's a good time to, <laughs> a good time to figure that out. Uh, but, you know, I, I'll, I'll go to a bookstore like that who will buy books for a couple dollars each, and I'll just grab them over the streets I can't see. I like to buy a lot of general books. Um, I like uh, history books. I like books about uh, kind of offbeat, oddball, American history. Well, up until that point, it was pretty much very consistent with what you published. I wouldn't say the oddball part, but the American history part is very much I, I read a lot of history with what you do. One of my personal interests is World War One, so I, I have a, a good collection of uh, 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 My last question for you is, has life changed much since becoming a commissioned lieutenant colonel for the state of Georgia? <laughs> it's, you know, I wear more, um, more Uniforms now, uh, more mint juleps. So, juleps are good. Uh, yes. So, uh, other than that, no, you know, I, I meet with the governor once or twice a week, uh, advising on news about publishing. You know, the, the funny thing is, you just write to the governor's office, and apparently, there's a couple of like commission as a lieutenant colonel in the aide de camp. So, I, I want to impress his current governor now. I, well, Dennis, as always, it is a great pleasure to have you stop by. I appreciate your time and your generosity to both of us and the hobby. Always a great guest, and I will tell you the deep We are the first guest to sign up to come to the Thank you very much for visiting. Thank you, Dennis. Dennis Tucker. We would like to thank our guests Dennis Tucker, James Sego, Rick Snow, Steve Roach, Jake. Sherlock from the ANA and Beth Deicher for taking the time to come by and share with us. As always, I've learned a, I have learned a lot. I hope that you did too. Uh, thanks to the great folks at the ANA for putting us both this fabulous show and our live webcast. A special thanks to Jake and the great people for making all this happen and for setting us up on the world in stage this year. Uh, for those who are regular listeners to the Coin Show podcast. Uh, they've been hearing me hype the new money.org, and I've been telling anyone who would listen how great it's going to be. It's launched and available. Go check it out for yourself, and you tell me if I've overhyped it in any way, because it is spectacular. 
As always, we'd like to thank our Facebook friends and our Twitter followers, the people that write in with ideas or the people that otherwise somehow inspire us. I'd like to thank my family for their love and support. They make me feel like I can do all this stuff and they're right, but most of all, I'd like to thank you, the listeners of The Coin Show, without whom this whole endeavor would be completely pointless. Uh, there will be a version of the show available on money.org if you'd like to go back and view it. There will also be an audio-only version available on Coin Show Radio at some time in the near future. Uh, the ANA does such a great job of putting on the World Fair of Money, and we're honored and flattered to be asked to be a part of us all. Uh, I'd like to dedicate this show to my brother Dave, who's in a whole listing. Keep up the fight. We're all pulling for you. Uh, so for The Coin Show, I'm Mike Nottleman, and we'll talk to you next time on The Coin Show.